Hello out there to everyone in YouTube land. It's time for another Vladcast program. I'm John Hill, your host, and my guest this month is Father Joyce. Father Gregory, as we like to call him. Father, how are you? I'm good, John. How are you today? Good to see you. Good, thank you. Glad to be here. All right, we're here to talk about October. October. Okay. Good month. Tenth month. Like that month. Well, we survived the festival and still going strong at St. Vladimir's? Yeah, the festival was great and I, I think that it, it introduced a lot of people in our, in our neighborhood, in our area, to the church and that was great. Okay. Yep, even got some new people who've been coming to church since then, so that's good. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, All made right. me very happy. So when I think of October, I think of uh, the Feast of the Protection, mm -hmm. Pakrov. Yep. And but I still I still I'm not really sure why it became such a big Slavic, such a big Russian holiday. It's a Greek thing. It is. And uh, they almost don't celebrate it basically. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't yeah. really add up. I think that the key to this being an important holiday for for the Russians, well, for the Rus and it came uh, to the Russians and Ukrainians after that also, uh, is that uh, those people, those unnamed people, or usually unnamed people who were attacking, who were laying siege to the city, those were the Rus. Those were the Rus. And when the, uh, because, you know, Constantinople for them was kind of like a, an ATM uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in, in that time frame. And so they would just stop by and, you know, mm -hmm. lay siege, pick make up a withdrawal. Gold. Yeah, make a withdrawal. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were stopping by to do the same as usual. And uh, this is when the Mother of God uh, appeared above the church and, and scared them away. And it made such an impression on them uh, that, uh, of course, but at that time, Christianity and paganism were living kind of side by side already in, uh, in Kiev and Rus. Um, but it made such an impression on them that when they became Christian in a much wider way after St. Vladimir, uh, that feast became very important uh, to, to, to the people of Rus. So, since then, it's been a big feast, and it became the Cossack feast also. So, um, anywhere where you have Cossacks who have re uh, sort of uh, immigrated, you'll you'll often have a, a church to the protection of the Mother of God. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, in our diocese, we had so many named after the protection of the Mother of God that one of them actually appealed to the bishop to get it changed, mm -hmm. to get the name of their church changed, and they did change it. Um, because obviously, he can't be in four places at once. Right. Is there a ban on any more churches? Uh Wanting to not officially, uh -huh. but certainly if someone uh, approached us and wanted to do that, uh, I think the bishop would suggest to them to think of perhaps another. Right. Maybe a church named after, oh, let's say Patriarch Tichon. That would be uh, excellent. Yes, and uh, I hope we can touch on that later about how. Yeah, it's why not so do it now? Okay, then let's. I I uh, know that uh, Patriarch Tichon was an interesting uh, hierarch, and. Um, I have an icon that I acquired uh, of him to uh, uh, intercede for my translation work. Ah, oh good, good. Well, I mean, he was here also in America for quite a few years and a really important hierarch in America. You know, this year is the 90th anniversary since his death. And so there's a symposium that's uh, taking place in Jordanville in the beginning of October. And um, since I'm the dean of our seminary, I got asked to, to give a paper there, and I'm happy to do that. And mine is about the contemporary veneration of, of St. Tikhon. And basically, what it boils down to is we know about him from books, mm -hmm. but we don't really greet him, meet him in the church, frankly speaking. There's no service for him. Well, there is a service, but it's basically never done because mm -hmm. he died on the day of the Annunciation. So uh, uh, obviously, there's the no room for him on that day. There's no room for him on that day. and, and there are, in, uh, in the church abroad, there are two churches named after him. One celebrates on the day of his glorification, which was November 1st on the, uh, on the new calendar, but that's also a big celebration of St. John of Kronstadt in the church abroad. Mm -hmm. And then the other is the 18th of, uh, celebrates on the 18th of November, which was his election as patriarch. Th that one, I guess, it, it kind of makes sense, but the issue is that there's no real day when he's celebrated widely. And mm -hmm. so people read about him, but they don't really name their kids after him. They don't mm -hmm. really name their churches after, the, after him. I mean, think, think about us North Americans from the Russian tradition who are living he, here now. He should be someone who's basically a universal saint. Mm -hmm. And he's known very abstractly, very sort of cognitively, but 
because his service is basically never done in the church, people don't really know him. So we, we in our church, we only have one Tikkun. I mean, he's a really cute little kid, but just one. And he's not exactly named after that Tikkun. Oh, I don't know. He might not be. He I might be named uh, after Zadonsky. Uh, that's possible. Or, or was there a Optina Tikkun? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. So that it could be. So this is the issue that he should be, uh, I think, based on his service in North America, based on his, you know, sort of being the leader of the higher martyrs of the Russian church in this great persecution, for, for those especially living abroad, he should be much more venerated. So who is, who's authorized to change that? Can we, can we do that here tonight? Well, I mean, I think we could, but I don't think anyone would listen to us or, or take what we did seriously. Synod of Bishops? Yep, I think it's the Synod of Bishops because, for instance, the Feast of St. John of Kronstadt on November 1st, that wasn't the day that he reposed. He, he reposed in, in December, late December. And, but that day has become the main celebration because the bishops celebrate then and that's sort of when the big celebrations are abroad. And so something like uh, St. Tikhon's election as patriarch on that day or the finding of his relics in February, that would be a great day. So I think if we just set that day and really go with it, then it'll be easier for people to sort of meet him on that spiritual level, not just on the academic or sort of purely cognitive level. So that's what my talk will be about, and uh, hopefully, you know, you know this little preview won't ruin it for the uh, few people that some, will hear it. <laughs> some of the other papers, uh, what they're going to be about? Well, I know that I, I looked actually up on uh, just briefly. Apparently, we have a live studio audience. Somebody here decided today. to to ruin the Vladcast. Well, Father. You happy know, birthday! They, thank you very much. You, you know how that works. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a very auspicious uh, day. This is our first Vladcast that has been crashed by a live studio audience. So, it's a flash mob. I, yeah, it's, it's, good, it's a good Vladcast flash mob. So, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we got a program Thank you, everyone, so much. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate it. Several saints came from just that time, like St. John Kucherov. We were talking about the St. John Kucherov Society. He was here during that time. Uh, you have St. Raphael of Brooklyn. He was a vicar for Patriarch Tikhon. So the, it was a very fruitful, and there were other saints as well that came from that time. So it was a very spiritually fruitful time. So I think that'll be an interesting one. And then there's a kind of a keynote speaker. Uh, he's a professor at Miami of Ohio, um, and he's a Russian historian, and he will talk about um, the organization of the Russian church um, before the reinstitution of the Patriarchate and then after the reinstitution of the Patriarchate. So I think that should be really interesting too. Well, so I thought maybe you can publish the papers and make a collection. Mm -hmm. That is the plan, okay. in, in theory. Uh, I think it just depends on whether the speakers follow through and give their papers, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so God willing that'll happen and I think it's interesting and I hope by the 100th anniversary of his uh, repose in 10 years, that there will be a firmly established date of his uh, commemoration. And I think if that happens, that his veneration will become much broader and much deeper, uh, at least in the West. God willing. I hope so. Okay, so are you still doing English uh, services? Yeah. Yep, once a month we do the full cycle of services. 
And this month it'll be the uh, evening of the 23rd of October and the morning of the 24th of October. And that morning of the 24th, that's kind of the kickoff of the marriage uh, retreat. There's a marriage retreat? Marriage retreat, yeah, on the 24th and 25th. So you can retreat from your marriage for a while? Well, you know, we thought that we would do it that way, but in the end we decided to keep the couples together. Okay. And, uh, and so we will have, uh, I think, a really nice um, couple of days together. And we have a really great speaker who's coming to lead the retreat, Father David Moser. Um, he's been a priest for a long time, and he has worked in family counseling for a long time. So to me, that's just a great combination for a retreat like this. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's going to be great. Awesome. And yep. everyone who's married is invited. Everyone who's married or who is considering to getting married uh, should come, I think. Uh, we're asking a donation of, I think, $50 for the whole weekend, which covers meals and all kinds of other stuff. Um, but, I mean, it's a free will offering if people can't afford it. We want them to come. That's, that's the key. And I think really actually crucial is that those couples who are engaged come. Because I think it's a, romance is really lovely, but uh, that's only one small part of marriage. And I think it's important to, to uh, be exposed to the other person for people to understand that marriage is hard work. You ready for stump, priest? I'm ready. Well, I don't have anything. Okay. Uh, but maybe we should talk about um, the intersection of modern medicine and spiritual medicine. I think that's a great idea. I like that idea a lot. Okay. Uh, I think that's really important. So we can, I guess I would sort of, uh, I think it's helpful, would be helpful for the viewers to break this into sort of uh, the psychological piece and the more physical piece. Obviously these are intertwined in our spiritual life and even in, when uh, you talk about approaching the wellness of a person, I think that most physicians realize that those things are intertwined. But I think for the, at least the beginning of the conversation, let's do that. So yeah, that's, our whole, that's our whole orthodox, uh, the, the body and the soul and everything kind of integrated. Right, you know, right, exactly. This Western separation. Absolutely, if you do something good for the soul, it's good for the body. And, Vice versa, you do something bad for the soul that often reflects on the body. Um, so the church has never been against medicine, modern medicine. And it, actually, if you go back to the time, well, like say, 4th century, 5th century, 6th century, a lot of the, the great theologians and uh, leaders of the church were also doctors. And, and so the church has not, and in fact, there are many celebrations on the church calendar of the unmercenary healers, those who were physicians who would heal people uh, for no charge, just for the sake of Christ. Uh, St. Pantaleon is the best known, but uh, actually we have uh, next month St. Cosmos and Damien. So, I mean, some of This is a specifically Byzantine uh, uh, institution or... Well, that tradition continued through... It, it, it started there, but it went throughout the Orthodox world. You find that in all local Orthodox churches. Um, maybe not saints necessarily, but that was an, uh, a, a way of serving man as, as Christ came to serve us. Um, and, I mean, probably the m most stark example of that uh, in, let's say, modern times in the last hundred years is the Martha and Mary uh, house that St. Elizabeth the New Martyr uh, set up in Moscow for all the girls who were just kind of pouring into the city as, as Russia industrialized. Um, and they had a free clinic, they had, you know, free dentistry, they had pharmacy, all of that. So the church is not against this at all. I mean, but I think we also have to l look at medicine through the eyes, through spiritual eyes, and say, well, just because something can be done from a medical point of view doesn't necessarily mean that that's helpful for the soul. And so that always, I think, is important. You know, if you're going to the doctor for a checkup, you don't need to consult with the priest. That's not necessary. But if we're starting to talk about, you know, ethically challenging things, then I think it's good to talk to the priest, to talk this through, and to understand that, you know, the church is not against medicine in any way, but just because something can be done doesn't mean it necessarily should be done. And, and those conversations, I think, are good to have on the front end before uh, you get into the position where you have to make that decision. So, but yeah, the church is very supportive of, of medicine. And also of psychology, I mean, you know, the church understands that there's a lot of healing that can happen here, but there's also a healing that can happen outside of the walls of the church. Um, with psychology especially, though, I always recommend to people that if you're, if you're engaging um, in counseling outside the church, that you 
more regularly go to confession or talk with the priest, either is fine. But I think partaking of the mysteries more often when you're in that position is probably helpful anyway. Um, but to be talking with the priest a little bit about what's happening there, there's a lot of psychology is, is rather secular in its approach. That's not necessarily bad, it, as long as we understand it in the context of our faith. Yeah. It, it seems like a person is uh, a little more, more vulnerable Mm-hmm. When that is right, because when we talk about the psyche, which is you know a, kind of an abstraction anyway, but the psyche, you're getting very close to the soul here. You know, th- there's a lot of, and I think it's very important that if we're scratching that, that we are also healing that from a spiritual point of view. So um, I found, I mean, okay, so I've been a priest about twenty years. It's not like I have a ton of experience, but in my limited experience. I found that when people are undergoing counseling, it does help them to come and be able to sort of bounce that off the priest and say, well, this is happening, you know, and especially things that they themselves are feeling a little uncomfortable with, it gives them much more confidence going into the counseling and it helps them to get more out of it because they're, they don't have to kind of, they don't always have to be on guard. They can kind of know where they can be comfortable and where if it gets to this point where it's, okay, we need to take a step back. So I think that's a really important uh, thing for people to understand. The church doesn't refuse us modern medicine whatsoever, but we want to interact uh, with uh, the priest about that so that we are staying within kind of the boundaries, which are quite broad, actually, uh, of, of what the church is, is laying out for us. And keep praying about it. Absolutely, because, you know, when, as you very rightly mentioned, the soul and the body are very closely intertwined. And so, therefore, if we are sort of wounded in our, in our body, um, this can also be something that can begin to affect the soul. And vice, it, versa. And, and vice versa. It can also be an opportunity for spiritual growth. And that's, of course, where we try to steer people. That, you know, if there is a bodily sickness, it doesn't mean that we should... Uh, you know, deteriorate spiritually. In fact, it's an opportunity for us to grow, perhaps spiritually. In fact, not perhaps it is, and we should look at that uh, in in that context. Absolutely. I hope that's helpful for, helpful for people. Um, yeah, I hope that's helpful for people. I, I I think that sometimes we have this feeling like, oh, you know, I don't I don't want to go to the doctor. Or, you know, I go to the doctor. Yeah. Oh, you 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 do. Mm-hmm. Okay. Pretty sure love to go to the doctor. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So have you ever been stumped? Sure, of course. And I think that it's really important. Uh, keep and, trying to stump the priest? Well, that's a helpful exercise, I think. And, uh, but actually, the first thing I remember being taught in seminary is, if you don't know, do not make something up. Right? Tell the person that asked you the question, I don't know, I'll find out, and I'll get back to you. And I, I've always tried to do that. I think it's really important that people understand the clergy are, are human. We are not, you know, like some encyclopedia, um, vast storehouse of knowledge. Okay, you learn things as you as you study and so on and so forth, but there's nothing wrong with saying, you know what, I'm not sure, but let me check with, you know, talk to the bishop or talk to a more senior priest who's had maybe some more experience, and of course I won't use your name, or, you know, but so that people understand that it's, you, you, sh- you shouldn't be basing your priesthood on infallibility. We don't have that in the East at all. And, you know, since Orthodox priests are married, most of us don't have that infallibility complex. But uh, we, it's very important to, to fess up and say, you know what, I don't know, but I'll find out. And I think people respect that, as I hope they do. So, uh, no plans to replace the uh, clergy with uh, robots? None that I'm aware of. I, they probably wouldn't tell us if they were going to, but I don't think so. All right, Father, any uh, parting words, more uh, stuff to talk about in October? Mm-hmm. Well, I think that October actually has some really interesting saints, like St. Sergius is coming up in the early part of October, or St. John the, the Theologian, really important saint, the Apostle John the Theologian. And also maybe up to the elders, very interesting uh, and, I, and we well, the whole uh, the whole lot of the synaxis, yes, and I, and Saint uh, uh, Leo, the first the first one is this month too, and right around that same time is the synaxis of all of them. And you know, it's I think that concept of eldership is a very interesting one to people, um, and 
a lot has been written about the Abtanian elders. In fact, there's a great series, a very comprehensive series about their lives uh, available in English. Really, really good. And um, so a lot of people know about them. Uh, but I think it's very important for us, just as we talked about with St. Tikhon, to, to, it's good to know cognitively, to know in your brain sort of about the saints, but it's important to meet them in church. And uh, so we will serve the service for the Abtanian elders. It'll be the evening of the 22nd of October and the morning of the 23rd. Well, I think that about does it, would you say, for the livecast October? I think so. Okay. I think it was a good, a good show, John. Thank you. It, were, it was full of surprises. It was. All right. Very interesting. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you. And we'll see you next time for the November livecast. Goodbye.